Thanks for stopping by Big Top Gaming. My name is Brian. And I'm Ethan. And in this battle report, we've got game three of round one with uh, Crix and Protectorate. So this week for the matchup, I decided to drop Harbinger. And that's because into Brian's pairing, I figured the death skew would be really good into Scar 3. Uh, because he doesn't have a lot of hit fixers for the infantry. And like they're all a bunch of Matt 7, Matt 8 with Vet Leader. But... My base defense on most things is 13 before Ash and Veil, before set defense, before Awe. And then with your off list being Scavarous, I felt like you couldn't really drop it because of Fiora 4 with like the battle groups just immune naturally. And then Harvey's Im list, her battle groups immune naturally. And then like the initiates can't be moved. So I can kind of stop you from TKing Harpy around just by literally placing dudes next to her that can't be moved. So then David Bergstorm's list is Harvey <laughs> with a Hierophant, <laughs> Devout, Double Crusader, Sanctifier, Double Punch Monks, Anastasia, Covenant of Menoth, High Paladin, Vilmon, two Champions of the Order of the Wall, two Menite Archons, Arak, Min Choir, and then of course three Free Initiate units. Did you have Anastasia Debray listed too? Yeah, I said that. Okay, sorry. I, I know like there's David Bergstrom and Bergstorm. Or it's, there's Daniel Bergstr Bergstrom Storm. No, I can't remember. There's too many. Too, I'm, I'm just going to call them all Burgles. Well, David's name is Bergstrom, but they mis like typed it on some page and called him Bergstorm. So now the Minnesotians call him Bergstorm as I still, a joke. I still think they should just adopt Burgles. All right, I mean, whatever floats your boat. So Ethan hit the nail on the head pretty hard. Uh, with the way that his pairing set up and that uh, in just protectorate shenanigans in general, I really couldn't drop Scavarus. And the way that Scavarus ends up putting out damage with the list, it didn't really seem like I was going to be really well advantaged into either of those lists, even if I did try to put Scavarus into Harbinger just to have some kind of long-range threat. But uh, the Scar list, I felt like, had the best shot at it. And uh, this one is from Tim Boy Suit, which I'm pretty sure I messed that. I'm going to say it different every time. But he's a player from Belgium, uh, has played on several several years worth of WTC, and I believe that he won or at least got in the top three of a solo Masters at the WTC one year. But anyways, the Scar 3 list that I got presented with was uh, Blood... Blood Priestess with Charybdis and a Slayer as the battle group, a Void Archon with Axiara and Gerlock as uh, requisition options. There's a Misery Cage in here for points. Uh, Gatsby 4 is in here controlling a Stalker. We've got double min unit of uh, Marauders, a max unit of Blood Gorgers with Jessica Blood Tongue as the requisition there, and then uh, the, the little unit of uh, Black Ogre and Iron Mongers. Now, I feel like I've got a decent shot into this list right now. I think that Scar leverages quite a bit of threat, and uh, there's a lot of bodies in here, and Ethan presents a lot of solos, so they probably don't want to be screwing around with all these uh, troll bloods with tough running around. So we'll see how this shakes out. I feel like the scenarios definitely got, I've got some favor in that because I do kind of spread out a little bit wider than Ethan's able to, but with that 20-inch uh, control, that might be a... Uh, a little bit of a misnomer. So we did have like a weird technical difficulty with this game the first time around, and it wasn't a battery dying or anything like that. I think I was shuffling some files around on my computer a little bit, and while that was happening, they just got deleted and then got forever deleted. Like I just couldn't recover the things. So uh, Harbinger ended up taking that first game, but we decided to re-rack, and whatever the results are from this game are the ones that are, is is the result that we're going to keep. Yeah. So we we just immediately replayed the game. And now this is the one we're recording and taking the final results. So, like, we both got to do a practice run. So, I won the roll to go first. So, I opted to go first with everything. And here, every I'm just running turn one. I kind of deployed a little symmetrical. Like, I have initiate unit towards the top, initiate unit towards the bottom, one in the middle to protect Harvey. Harvey's running turn one just to get the awe and martyrdom bubble up as far as I can. 
but I still have enough shield guards near me in case Scar gets a little tricksy and tries to just plunk me with some AoEs, including having uh, Vilmont base to base with me. Thanks to the leadership from the champions, he, the uh, other paladins give girded, so that way he, he can't just try and drift onto Harby either. So like being just blanket immune the blast damage is pretty nice. And I'm playing really aggressive with the champions. I have one on each side. They threaten super far, like 15 inches before Righteous Vengeance. Because uh, Vilmont gives them Righteous Vengeance just forever. And then they leadership him and the initiates girded. And then I have a Punch Monk on each zone. And I'm trying to leverage that top zone with the obstruction just to park a Punch Monk right behind it where you cannot see. Just always in shifting stance just to slow down the scenario and make Brian come to me. Because, like like he said, he can play a little bit wider than me because of my martyrdom bubbles only, and I'm air quoting only 12. <laughs> but, like, the punch punks can really slow down the scenario because it's hard for his stuff to hit it. And then that kind of just leverage and lets the grind go to me. And then everything's just kind of running up. So for my deployment, I've, I've got a big unit of Blood Gorgers at the bottom with uh, Jessica in there. Uh, giving them Relentless Charge, it means that I can kind of mitigate the forest a little bit and that rough terrain uh, or rubble in the bottom. The double min Marauders have kind of like shuffled up towards that top zone. And then a lot of my support and jacks or my heavy hitters are kind of towards the middle here. I've got a pretty sweet deal with this rock and forest in that I can utilize Gatsby to... Um, kind of block off some some line of sight. I know that doesn't do a whole lot with Scar being in the list, but with uh, uh, with Ethan not really having any ranged presence other than just charging with things that go pretty far, I don't think I have to worry too much about, um, about things getting into Scar right away. I did take Eyeless Sight as my objective. Yeah, I think I took Puppet Master. I think you did. And like, I purposely left the top Menite there. I believe he's within range of the objective, so if you tried the cloud, I could be a little bit frisky, but now here's Scar doing some frisky stuff. Yeah, so I, the first game taught me some things, and, uh, it, or not taught me some things, it definitely, like, showed me that there, I was probably, like, not really believing in the, the, the durability that comes with Scar, and I think that's one of the things with Battle Engine Casters, where it's like a, there's a really fine line between tanky and very much not so like lilith 3 is a probably the battle engine caster i've played the most and uh that she just doesn't tank like someone like scar or mckay does so i assessed kind of what um ethan's threat ranges were and what it was that he could put into scar turn one and i'm like okay if you get two menite archons on me i'm perfectly fine with that so what i've done here is just uh put some spells up with Scar and then charged her forward. I ended up doing the the slipstream or dark waves with Charybdis because my my goal is to have Charybdis hanging out too. So now Ethan's got to choose one Menite Archon can get into Charybdis, another Menite Archon can get into Scar but can't get into Charybdis also. So there's only one that's going to be able to get to where he wants to get to. And then I jam a, a Servitor in front to kind of make things a little bit more wonky. So like I've presented Ethan with some really big pieces in my army, knowing that the chances of him being able to rip them off right now are very slim. And if he decides to unpack those Menite Archons into me, it means that I can kill them and not have to worry about Harbinger uh, doing a bunch of uh, martyrdoms on them because they're just not valid targets for her. So my approach to this is try and deal with the things that Harbinger can't really do do much with so that would be the menite archons and the warjacks um i think with gang and uh um yeah i think just with gang i should get a pretty good shot at being able to take down menite archons because the uh ashen veil doesn't bother charybdis so i don't think brian took into crusaders call into effect like he eyeballed the the painted menite archons threat into charybdis but I think with Crusader's Call, I can get both of them, and I believe I'll start measuring it sometime on my turn. But here I opt to ambush Anastasia off screen so she can go for Juicy or Janessa. Yeah, I like calling her Juicy. But, yeah, you um... called her Juicy the whole game, so I started calling her Juicy. <laughs> I can get a backstab charge into her, 
And like if I can get rid of the tough no knockdown bubble, that means the Menite Archon doesn't have to go down there and start threshering with his Grievous stick or flail. Yeah, it was some really unfortunate positioning. It's like uh, I just kind of wasn't paying attention to where Jessica was in the unit. And uh, now that that makes them a little bit less threatening, I feel not super comfortable with what's going on in that bottom zone. And here, I believe I go into the tank a little bit because, like, I want a Crusader's Call. I want to purify because he put up the Draconic Blessing on the Blood Gorgers. And, uh, like, I'm thinking about moving up and get a cheeky rebuke. Uh, so here, I believe Anastasia's doing her charge. She hits. I want to say she's, like, dice minus nine. Yeah, it was something something like that. Um, eventually, like what ended up happening out of this is Jessica got left on three boxes. I believe she's on one where you just marked oh, it. Oh, one, sorry. Yep, that's right. So, like, to talk about last game, like I played Harvey pretty cagey myself. Like I was really scared of just Scar getting some gunshots on her and just dropping her. So I didn't move up aggressively to feet. And now, like, I'm thinking... I can get that champ onto Janessa if he impact attacks and kills two trolls. He has to kill them both with tough no knockdown, and then he can get his lance attacks. He has to stand on where one is. And I'm like, I'm not really trading this because I think Harvey's going to push deep into the bottom zone. That way I can leverage some stuff. And here I just do easy stuff of initiates charging. So the front two charge... The back one just runs to stay in shield guard range of Harby. And like here I'm measuring where do I think Harby's going to end up moving. And then I just keep one back just to be a little bit safe. Max command to six, front two or base to base. I believe I opt to do two separate charge attacks. The first one misses and the second one misses. Uh, Matt six needing a six. Scribitus is a 12. Yeah, he's a 12er. Yeah, so rolling threes right like back to back was sad. But they're just it, incidental damage. And then I believe there I forgot to roll. I always forget to do continuous effects at the beginning. So I had to roll on the Menite Archon and here's one out. So Harvey has just feeded. Uh, she purified for three thanks to the Hierophant. I pulled one from the rack. And now I'm getting a little bit spicy and aggressive with her. I purify Draconic Blessing because it gives immunity fire, so it gives immunity to Harby's feet. So if I can strip it, that means Brian will only have one unit immune if he recasts it instead of just like cycling it. So here I opt to, thanks to the Hierophant, or no, I'm just straight up within 10 of Rebuke. Hierophant makes a range 12 Rebuke, which is pretty nice, but I didn't need it. So. I get Rebuke on the unit too. I know he has Dispel on the Priestess, but that will force her to come down and then actually punch one. So, And I'm still camping three. So like, I feel like Harvey's in a decent spot because she did put up a Crusader's Call as well, I believe. Yeah, Purify for three, Crusader's Call for two. And here I put in the bottom Menite Archon. I did not thresh her. You can see from the grid I only did believe yeah it wasn't a ton of damage on the i think one of the one of the um paladins came in with a decent no never mind maybe it was the manite just crapped it was the, the bed manite. crapped the bed in the first one so charybdis is sitting pretty well so when i when that when that manate archon came in and did so little damage i was feeling pretty good about how um, Charybdis was positioned in this one because it's keeping your Menites off of Scar, and as long as Charybdis is continuing to be functional, uh, I'm pretty happy with how the that first Menite charge went. Yeah, I was really hoping it would do a little bit more. Uh, Charybdis, I wanted to really take, because he's what threatens deep in the list in there. Top champion charges max reach on the Slayer, hits, POW 16, sets him on fire. Just doing my charge. Does okay. I believe it takes out the left arm, and then I repo back into martyrdom range. Uh, so I just did the math on my folks. My math is right. With rack and hierophant, I am sitting on three after casting purify, crusader's call, and rebuke, because I didn't need the boost the rebuke, which is pretty nice. So my plan is just to stay out of void, walking six. Uh, because he's behind the woods 
and that way he can't get within Grievous Wounds range, so that way he won't get a teleport on the Harvey. So that unit of initiates moves up within three of Harvey, outside of 11, the walk spray threat of Under Martyrdom. And then I might have moved Vilmont already just to get yeah, base Vilmont, to base Harvey. Yeah, Vilmont's already in base to base. After Harvey moved, I think that was like your, your, your number one thing to do after. Yeah, like he brick and mortar stances and just follows Harvey all game. Choir go up. I can only do it to three of the jacks, but I do the no spells or no magical shooting because you have no offensive spells. Yeah, no offensive spells. And Scar's got magic cannons, but, you know, that's about the run of it, I think. I think it just stops the marauders from chucking. So there, now the top unit of initiates with Crusader's Call can go in. And I think importantly, the Menite took out the movement, so I'm just doing single attacks now. It's a boosted POW 12s. Mm -hmm. uh, Crimdus is only armor 18. Yeah, he's only armor 18. He doesn't have unyielding or anything like that, so he's pretty, uh, pretty fragile. But you can see from the grid, those Paladins did quite a bit of work. So when I was thinking about threat ranges, I was really only looking at the Menite Archons. I didn't really think that the Initiates were going to come into him and do a bunch of work. But I think uh, those Initiates actually did more than the Menite Archon did. So Charybdis is still up, and with one with one arm, he's at least functional for an attack with, with Gang Fighter. But now Ethan's unpacking the other Menite, and I think that this is uh, Charybdis's, like final nail in the coffin. And then here, actually, like, you let me do a take back. I was like, I really don't want to send up my second Menite. It's like, Crybdis is on fire in Field of the Flames range. I'm like, if it doesn't go out, I think fire kills him. And I'd rather have the second uh, Menite protecting Harby, mm -hmm. just in case you try and get cute with something over there, and basically blocking the landing spot of Scar, so that way she couldn't get melee to Harby. Because I'm not really scared of anything else getting to her with awe, and Ashenvale down there now. So, like, even if you strip Rebuke, I don't think Gorgers can kill her. No, I don't think so either. With Mad 8, um, and they're only POW 11, I think, POW 13 with the with the Draconic Blessing, it's going to be rough. Yep. And there the champion went in, impact attack, hit both, killed both, charge attack, killed Janessa, and I was like, go, go, gadget champion. Yeah, that was, like, the, the perfect storm for you. So now with Jessica down, that unit is... Uh, it's not that they're dead to me. It's just that they are not going to get the uh, efficacy that I was hoping for. Punch Monk moves up outside of stopping Martyrdom walk and spare range, and I call it a turn. So there were a lot of things that went wrong for me on, on that last turn. Losing Jessica to the, the, the Paladin glory charge was not fun. And then uh, watching Charybdis... Uh, go down and it, he didn't go down actually when I when I did the fire check the fire went out and uh, I think that when I first thought about that I was like well that's cool and then as I'm starting to like kind of assess my turn and what I need to do right now uh, I really wish he did die to just get out of my way but I've got some interesting things that I can do on the top zone for uh kind of manufacturing some stuff for scar so i'm looking at uh moving up my slayer who i think this one has one bad hand from a charge yep and uh we go ahead and do a one-handed throw with the or at, at with the pet we throw one hand throw the paladin and i'm trying to throw it at the uh allegiant of the order of the fist that's hanging out behind this wall and then ethan and i have to take a small break to look up the rules on the throwing deviations because we just i don't do throws enough and it's been a good long time since ethan did so after we ended up figuring out the throw deviation uh the paladin ended up landing in a place where i really didn't want him to be but um he's at least not where i think i want scar to be right now so my just the the gist of my plan here is that scar is going to get dash up of course and she doesn't get the plus one speed but she does get the ignore free strikes other way other way around yep oh yeah i'm sorry so um i think i'm still sitting here in this in this mindset thinking that i can probably make a play for the top zone um and part of it's going to be trying to get scar up there and that kind of puts me in a in a position where she's away from a, the the majority of ethan's army and i can just go ahead and start screwballing around in that top zone to try and make some uh measurable scenario play but as this uh turn kind of starts 
playing out. Um, I'm kind of having second thoughts about what I'm doing there because uh, I don't feel like I want to take a whole ton of free strikes from the the pile of paladins and uh, Menite Archon. So what I end up doing then is I, I'm trying to figure out ways to start taking out some of those pieces. And I think that uh, I'm thinking... I'm, I think that I'm thinking. Uh, I've At this point, I'm in the boat of thinking that the Void Archon is going to try and find a way to get into that group of Paladins so that he can uh, try and blow some of them out of the water. And with the Entropic Aura, there's going to be no Martyrdom business, so that would take out some of the Free Strike business that we've got going on up there. And then possibly there's a chance that... Um, that I might be able to get the Menite Archon with my Void Archon. So this is a, I know that I'm just burning clock right now, which is really what Harbinger likes to see, but I feel like this is um, a really pivotal point in the, in the game for me. And uh, I've got Scar up so far that I'm thinking there's like a couple different routes I could go in terms of projecting her survivability the issues are that um ethan's got his jacks kind of positioned in a fashion where uh that sanctifier is really dangerous and i believe there's one more crusader somewhere in that pile of stuff with harbinger in the middle no there's a crusader on top crusader on the bottom and then the sanctifier and devouter in the middle okay yeah i'm sorry it's uh i'm just losing the the metal crusader that we've got on the table and then the castigator that's playing the role of as the sanctifier are kind of looking the same to me right now but um i decide that this is this is how i'm going to do things right now with scar and uh this was this is where like the dash thing comes up because i was like i'll just put up dash and then i don't have to worry about any of this and then uh this is where the feet came up because we didn't yeah. measure how far away harvey was to scar before she moved and now that we're rewatching it you might have been uh, further close. away yeah because if you end closer you take the pow we thought it was like about the same distance so brian let me take the damage and i rolled box cars yeah and uh that was not good for scar i was like kind of hoping for um for big wins here so now we're rolling it back because we realize that dash doesn't give her parry um and uh i think you're you're talking to me about trying to take the damage back too and i was like well let's just leave it on because i think i'm gonna go a little bit more dangerous dangerous with scar here and uh, i've got up dark i've taken done the feet i have dark waves up i've got uh draconic blessing on gatsby i've got uh um guided fire up just so because why not when you're taking one point to boost three shots and uh i think at this point i've decided that my end game here is going to be trying to take out um, either the Sanctifier that's next to Harbinger. So this way, if that thing goes down, I think it would be harder for the Crusader to get into Scar. Um, but uh, because I can just kind of jam out the Crusader on the other side. It is worth noting, we missed it. Brian had to take a free strike from one initiate, and he rolled trip sixes on Scar. Yeah, I'm so, that one was harsh. So, like, this was my, I think Scar's going to be fine and tank through a lot of this. And then when you roll triple sixes on a free strike, uh, Scar's sitting on, like, maybe half her boxes. Yeah, she's she's pretty beat up right now. And uh, I end up buying a bunch of ram shots into the back of this Menite Archon. And I think that when... You're in oh, awe and Ashenvale because you're living, so yeah. it's like... It's rough, so the the Menite walks away just fine. Yeah, because there was a couple of scars shot that she hit. I actually shield guarded to the initiates away, and like I was hoping blast damage would kill <laughs> uh, Charybdis, but I wasn't that lucky. Yeah, I and still like I'm still in the boat of thinking that like Charybdis is still better to me dead than alive right now because he's kind of like harsh in my chill in terms of uh, walking around with Gatsby. So um, I believe. I don't know if we missed it or if it just hasn't happened yet, um, but Gatsby was the target for the Dark Waves move, and given the way that we kind of reconfigured the movement, there's a chance that he might not have been completely in for that, so I'm, I'm not 100% sure of that one, but... Uh, yeah, because you moved Gatsby when you moved over the pile of initiates, but yeah. now that you moved the opposite way, he might not have been within two when you started. Yeah, so it, that that got a little it get, got a little weird. This is one of the problems, I guess, with kind of re-engineering your turns like this or trying to roll back to where things like I think in the real world it would be, well, I just made a mistake and thought Scar got um, 
parry. parry and then now you would take like eight freaking free strikes and uh, probably drop her. Just three initiates and two menites. Yeah, nothing big there. Actually, um, it would be, yeah, it'd five, be one, one five initiates. Yeah. Five initiates, two menites. Because yeah. it would be flying over all of them. It would hurt real bad. So um, the Void Archon ends up going up to kind of peel off some of these initiates because my, my goal here is that um, Gatsby is going to be trying to flicker into charge range of Harbinger. So I get uh, a few initiates here and there, and I'm, I think that we try to go in for the Menite Archon, but it just doesn't like pan out for him either. But this was this was a pretty long and involved turn. So next up here, it's going to be the Ironmongers going up. I think one of them has range to repair Scar. Uh, you tried to, and I was like, my feet's up, so they oh, died. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, and I was like, do you want to move the back ones? Because they're all just going to pretty much auto-die under my feet. Yep, this was like the... Um, this this I am so deep in the tank this turn that I'm like... You you know that scene in Waterworld where they got that guy that they shove into the bottom of the boat to check their tank? Like, that's what I feel like I am right now. I'm the dude rowing around in the in the pile of go-juice. So um, the, the, uh, the Stalker ends up taking out the Menite Archon. I feel like that was a really important part to me being able to get things to where I want to. Um, plus, it's just good to get rid of Archons if there's a contingency plan after this. So uh, now we're getting into the, the Flicker shenanigans. And I think uh, the, this turn was so much of a dumpster fire that I didn't initially first see this thing until Ethan pointed out to me. And I'm like, well, it's just all or nothing here. So... We've got Dark Shroud up on Gatsby. We have um, Draconic Blessing on him as well. So I think that makes us hit at POW 20. 17? 20. 20. Sorry, 20. So um, with the only issue with Gatsby is maybe trying to hit, because I think we need sevens right now. Yeah. And uh, as you can see, my dice kind of, they're, they're not super on camera, but we miss the first couple attacks. And then for damage, we end up, we're dice plus two isn't it i'm armor 14 your dice 14 plus dice six. plus six sorry so it was like it was it was one damage after all the focus fate or all the focus yeah it's shots. dice plus one after focus yep so uh gatsby rolled abysmally horrible and when i did actually get through on uh on harbinger i ended up not doing anywhere near enough damage to try and like r recuperate anything so right now scar's sitting down uh, the barrel of a Sanctifier, a Menite Archon, and a Crusader. So I need to try and figure out some way to make things work. So I'm at this point, I'm just trying to save face and activate the Marauders up top. So going into my turn, Scar's on half health. Scenario hasn't been scored. I feeded really aggressively to keep any solo off his flag, too. Like, and I believe I scored my flag thanks to the book. So, like, I'm already up 1-0. No, I think the Void Archon can test. Oh, like yeah, that's a Void. I was like, oh, because he's facing the other way. Yeah, he is. It, it so looks like your. Blind. it should be your Archon right now. So, Menite Archon just charges. Yeah, and I probably could have done something with the Blood Gorges in the bottom to kind of stop this up, but I think... My I, feet's up, so they just die. Yeah, and I have Draconic Blessing on Gatsby instead, so it's not like they could really do much. I mean, you could hope they tough and block a landing spot. Yeah, that's the best I could hope for. Uh, the Menite leaves her on four. Initiates just charge in. They get out of my way. They don't CMA. Yeah, and I think they don't. They, yeah, they don't do much of anything into her just because of the low pow into the higher armor. But mm -hmm. you've got a nice big landing spot. Well, I mean, the the Sanctifier was already engaged with her, so Snake he goes eyes in for the for the the maze. for his for his giggle stick, and, and then, then you fist. just yeah, your fist kills me. That's how like depressing that was. That Scar died to a Sanctifier's fist and not his cool Keyblade. Yeah, like, I feel like we both learned a lot from the first game, and, like, it didn't get to really show the second game, because first game was, like, a two-hour grind fest. Yeah, it was super long. I think in the in the first game, uh, I want to say that I clocked in that one. Yep, you clocked, and at the end of the game, I had two CPs to your one, just because, yeah. like, you didn't contest my flag one turn. And then I scored it, and then nothing ever got scored again because Punch Monks were just in the zones. And, like, you got the Blood Gorgers into my Initiates and into my Menite Archons game one. Mm -hmm. But, like, you weren't... You didn't realize how big of a skew set defense with Ashenvale with Awe is. Like, your stuff literally could not hit me game one. 
and the only thing that did was Charybdis, who came and killed a Menite Archon, and then I killed him. Yeah, it was a uh, it was one of those things for me at least. Like I, I in Mark II, I've played against Harbinger quite a bit. Um, things were of course different back then, but um, in the more recent history of Mark III, I've played against Harbinger twice now, and each time I dropped into her, it was with ranged lists. So the set defense Ash and Veil stuff didn't really come up that often because most of my shooting came from constructs. And, uh, well, I guess that doesn't matter. Ash and Veil just gives you concealment regardless. Yeah, but it's only for that model. Whereas, yeah. like, game one, I had uh, a Menite Archon, and I put, like, a unit yeah, initiates like next base to, to base yeah, right next like, to it. So your one-inch melee infantry was an Ash and Veil. I think that's probably where some of the math got skewed in our, like, Makeda Brawl game, where I was thinking that Swarm worked like Ash and Veil did. Yeah, it doesn't. So, um, so with that, I didn't really respect how... Um, much I would have to pay attention to the def skew for Scar. And in the first game, it was a little bit more aggressive on my part with the units and not so aggressive with my big uh, money pieces like Scar, Charybdis, and uh, and Gatsby. So what I kind of picked up as this game went along is that um, into this particular matchup, I need to really respect the Harbinger feat. And uh, Draconic Blessing does a lot in helping me get around that. And Gerlock can make it so that uh, the Blood Gorgers, with having two attacks each, can actually get a decent chance. And it is a chance at starting to hit things and taking them out at POW 13s. And if I end up getting, like, Dark Shroud bots or something up there, it becomes a little bit more reliable damage-wise. Things that I had issues with in that, though, were trying to, like, I, I dismounted the Paladin. Um, you didn't end up martyring that down, but once he was on foot, uh, took him out of combat with most of my stuff. So a lot of the things I was uh, were a lot of the things I was trying to do just really didn't matter so much. And that's when I had kind of picked up that if I can go for Harvey's Jacks and the Menite Archon, those are things that you can't really affect with martyrdom, and their defensive values aren't high enough to where it becomes a real big issue for me to try and hit them. I mean, it's not easy per se, but it's a little bit um, easier than trying to go into like uh, punch monks, initiates that are base to base, and uh, um, what is the other thing? No, I think that's it. That are the only things I really would care about. I mean, like Vilman, I'd never really get into. But um, so what I ended up picking up with that was you know here's the pieces i need to prioritize getting rid of and then from there it's uh those being the heavy hitting pieces the menites and the jacks mean that gaspy and scar can kind of not run the table so to speak but it's very difficult for you to actually start putting a lot of work into them so uh the hope in this turn was to try and find ways to peel those pieces out and then as the turn started to evolve we started to realize that the uh the threat ranges that Scar projects and transfers over to Gatsby, especially with uh, Dash. Like, Dash is just such a um, a, a ball-busting spell on flying models. So, like, when Vlad 3 gives Menite Archons Dash and Scar 3 gives um, uh, the Gatsby and the Void Dash. Or uh, not the Void, the, Void. Do, the Void doesn't get it, but Gatsby gets Dash. Um, Cyrenia can do it with... Uh, with the Menites as well, it really kind of skews things because of the way that the flying models mess around with line of sight and the fact that they can just kind of fly over your jams. And this this list already brings a lot of threat projection between Dark Waves, Flicker, and Dash that um, I can really start to leverage the things that people are really scared of with Gas before. And uh, with Draconic Blessing on top of that, he just starts hitting like a truck between that and Dark Shroud. So uh, if and I had maybe a better idea of that before I started playing this game, because this was like, I think with any caster, you need to play at least at, at bare minimum five games before you really understand what the heck they do or what a list does even. Like, Scar is pretty straightforward, but when you start putting all these pieces together, um, that game plan starts to kind of come out at you. So I feel like I was just getting there, and that first game showed me this is how you don't play because everything was real cagey. I was putting up clouds and making sure Scar didn't get in the middle of the table, and then by the time my clock started running out, I was like, I have done nothing this game. But it, with this game, I felt like if I presented her a little bit more aggressively, it would force you to have to become active in the game, and then that just gave me the opportunity to take a chance at your caster with Gatsby, which I feel like was my best opportunity to win this game. Yeah, if you had seen the Gatsby play at the beginning of your turn, like, 
because I didn't see it. Mm-hmm. Uh, like we said, he might have been out of the dark path range, but all Scar would have had to do was fly over behind yeah, him. Yeah, just move around because none then, of the stuff in the middle mattered for the Gatsby charge. No, so like, she, she didn't need to get rid of anything. Yeah, because you could have literally just dashed Gatsby flickers. You probably would have killed Charybdis, just shot him just to get him out of the path because like, you couldn't dark path the full two inches because you had to stop at Charybdis. Yep, and if Scar would have just started punching Charybdis with the ram, then that would have given me a better threat projection and maybe the Void Archon could have found a way to get a spray onto Harbinger instead of uh, having to go into all that other garbage. So You could have gotten a spray on her just by walking through the woods. Yeah. Because uh, like, I knew you could get the spray on me and I was like, okay, one boosted spray, dice damage, I'm camping, three focus, nothing else can get to me, I'm fine with that. And then you just give me the Void. But like, Gatsby getting there would pretty much kill me. Yeah, well, in, in a normal world would have killed you, but in this particular situation, Gatsby came up just a little short on dice. He allocated one to the Stalker so it could jump and then, like, boost an attack. Yeah, I was punching uh, that Menite Archon out of the way, but again, I didn't need to do that. So that was just... I shouldn't um, have just... I should have just let you keep it. Because you were like, you had Gatsby's, and you're like, what do I do? Like, you're like... I think you were thinking, you're like, well, I'm dead. And I was like, that looks like a charge lane to my caster because i did not box off like that you can kind of still see it if the image is up uh there's an initiate next to the wall he didn't move over to where harvey was going to be so like there's that little bunker there of where gatsby fit where that initiate should be standing yeah and i didn't move him over enough yeah the uh the 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 two inch reach on gatsby to get into harbinger here was it wasn't at its max but it was pretty close so um, Gatsby had just barely had barely had the the juice to get to where he needed to, and at that point, like I said, if I would have recognized this, maybe there was a play for Scar to try and clear a landing spot for him somehow. But um, you know, I think that overall, this is the Gatsby. The end of this game was kind of how I think this list wants to play when it's kind of pushed up against the ropes because you can just unpack Gatsby out of nowhere and just like straight up, you know, yeet a caster off the table. And that's, I feel like that's just Gatsby in general. Like he's such a good second wave piece where when you talked about like if Gatsby goes in after the things that can hurt him are dead, he runs the table and there's pretty much nothing I can do to him. Like if the... If you had left Scar back and Gatsby just goes up, kills the Menite up in the middle there, like I got nothing over there that can kill him. I have a knockdown Crusader that can mate that could charge, spend one to stand up, charge, and then hope to hit him through focus, but he would still be camping a few. Yeah, I think the average would just be like three or four damage on those. Yeah, when Gatsby is camping, like he's just straight up he's not unkillable. Outside of like certain Crick's feats, but my God, is he a nightmare to kill? But yeah. that's like that's Gatsby, and I feel like because I've played in the Scar Three plenty of times pre Gatsby, and I know how to out attrition like attrition into her. Like the reinforcements is really annoying, but Gatsby just gives her another layer of like assassination potential, and it's another mini brick in a brick that you have to have the tools to deal with while dealing with all these tough, no knockdown trolls that she poops out every turn. Yeah, I think the the list kind of evolves a little bit with Gatsby where like you, you still can have the trolls do a lot of things because dash is really good for them. Deceleration makes sure that you can get them there a little bit safer, but then decel on Gatsby is also nice. And uh, you just have like all these trolls that people get to chew on and then a big old caster that's hard to kill and then Gatsby along with Charybdis just hanging out ready to take out whatever's behind them. I feel like overall this Scar 3 list feels really really potent and if I were a routine Crix player uh, I think that it would be a really um, present list in my pairing. Yeah Scar 3 Scourge is just a phenomenal list and now we, we are recording this after the announcement that death archons are going into scourge yeah and that would be really interesting because like i feel like with this list gatsby kind of makes it so you don't really need the void archon i mean he's your anti-tough anti-harvey tech like he is but then the void archon can do quite a bit too and or, i mean the, the the death archon feels like a really strong piece for this list if you're trying to really get drill down on that but i, I guess like eh, the void with entropic aura and having the spray and the weird threat ranges 
The big thing is the Void can collect the souls from the trolls. Yeah. But as written right now, the Death Archon can only collect friendly faction corpses, not friendly. Mm -hmm. So in Scourge, there's no corpses from them. You need to get them from me. Yeah, and that'd be a little rough. Yeah, so like that's the only downside to the Death Archon being in Scourge is it's not friendly faction, so it doesn't proc gang fighter. And I could see a few Crix players picking one up because they're really excited for that three inch melee. Mm -hmm. And that's like, well, it doesn't help you. I think it would be when I was thinking about the Death Archon recently. I thought about that, or I thought that um, the Witch Coven would be a really good place for it because they can like deliver it to where um, you don't have to worry about. Uh, the corpse collection being a real big issue for them because you know you're you're actually going to deliver that death archon pretty early and pretty safely. Yeah, but you can say that with coven for like anything. Yeah, I know. I guess it's just like the the death archon has a lot of um, output potential, probably more so than anything else that's in uh, in. Uh, I was going to say Slaughter Fleet, but it's Scourge of the Broken Coast. Between, like, Gatsby can be in there, and then the, the Death Archons, like, I think that, that there's some value in there. But I do understand that the, the Death Archon has some problems out, playing outside of its own faction. Yeah, otherwise, like, I think the Death Archon is amazingly good. Mm -hmm. He's actually not as broken as I thought he would be. Yeah. So, but that's, like, I set the bar pretty low for that. Mm -hmm. uh, I still think it's phenomenal. I know, like, there's a few... I don't want this to turn into a death. Yeah, I know. Rant. We'll focus on our on our uh, on our on our. Uh, I know we talked more about report. game one than we did about game two. I think too. I know, like this. I feel like it was. I didn't. I, when you watch this game, I think that it feels like I was just kind of haphazardly playing the game through because I had this idea of like, let's just get this over because we suffered through the the two almost two and a half hour game of Harbinger first time around, and then the like the 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 sheer soul crushing potency of watching all of your files get deleted and this is the second time this has happened with a harbinger game because i played a game against uh lance from brutal damage with my siege one list from and actually it's it's really funny there's a lot this is like cosmic f funky times right here so i was playing daniel bergstrom's list of siege one into a harbinger list that lance had brought and then when i got that game home and started editing something weird went on with double naming the uh the audio files and it's it rewrote everything so it was like an ice and fire video that was over this commentary for uh uh, for this war machine game so that one got deleted and wiped out and then the second harbinger game uh that was david bergstrom's list now is had gotten wiped out at first too so like um when we came back in i tried to make it seem like i wasn't you know playing this way because i just wanted to get the game over and move on with things um but i did feel like 100 percent. i made a lot of the, the a lot of the calls that i made were accurate like that turn one play of just saying go ahead and charge me with whatever i'm just going to present this stuff like losing charybdis sucked but um yeah, you could have kept him back, cause uh, cause game one, Crybdis came in, he killed a Menite Archon, cause he out threatens all my stuff even with Crusader's Call, and I didn't feat mm -hmm. early that game like I did here. Like I waited till like turn three, maybe turn four. Like I should have feated turn two. I was just trying to get really greedy with the uh, positioning and like to try and feat to keep you from getting into my flag area. Well, yeah, and Charybdis was a rock star in that first game because not only did he kill the Menite Archon, but I think he killed the Sanctifier also all in that one activation. Uh, he got it pretty dang low. Like, he crippled it, but it was still kicking. Yeah, just uh, on a little bit, though. So I think Charybdis just did more than what he what he was, what he was prescribed to. So, like, I, I definitely could have played him a little further back to make sure that that wasn't a huge... or that I wasn't just giving him away. But I think uh, overall, I, I don't... If I could go back in time and do something different in this game, it would probably be to just recognize the Gatsby threat range and what I can do with Dash in him and uh, try and play Scar a little bit more towards um, getting the assassination to work that turn mm -hmm. instead of screwing around with all of this. Let's charge her up and try and get her to kill the Menite because that's what we want to do. I think when you did that, you're like, oh, I can trivially kill a Menite. And I was like, you just charged into Awe yeah. and Ashenvale. So like... 
you needed scars i mean scars not a bad match. no she's, she's like what matt seven matt seven and then i had you in the butt so like i felt like i was mitigating a little bit but then when that ash and veil thing came up it was like uh, i need to boost these hits yep and boost the damage it was just really rough because i shield guarded one of the shots and i think i let it kill an initiate that wasn't in base to base and then you get your uh your your right i got super angry yeah your angry armor business and I think that's why, like, Righteous Fury. game two, you tried to be really more aggressive and not try to out-attrition me because if you try an out-attrition Harby, you're in for a bad time most of the time. Yeah, there are some lists that can do it, but they're very pointed at trying to do that thing. It's not like you just accidentally out-attrition Harbinger. Like, you almost have to have a list built with that solely in mind. Yeah, because, like, all my stuff's based F13. Pretty much your big threats... Like, my order of things I needed to kill and I was scared of was, like, Void Archon first, Charybdis, then Gatsby, because I knew Gatsby would be back. And those front two are, like, the big threats just because Charybdis, he punches really well. And threatens pretty deep, too. Exactly. Like, game one, Charybdis was behind the woods, and then I couldn't move up the board with my caster because I was scared of Charybdis getting a four-inch melee onto her somehow over the dudes in front. Yep. So I had to play really cagey, where this time you played a more central, like to try and scare my flag. So that let Harvey move around to the bottom once I knew he wasn't a threat anymore. Yeah, Anarchy is one of those scenarios where, like, you know, we've played three games of this in a row now, where, like, I feel, for, for me at least, this is kind of giving me a lot more... Um, insight into how to mess around with these scenarios a little bit because it's one thing to play in your steamrollers and just like go from scenario to the next scenario to the next but like as we've been playing this out i've noticed that with anarchy if you want to stay scenario relevant you're probably going to want to split your army quite a bit and when you do that that leaves you really wide open in the middle i think i used to do this with butcher three all the time um where you kind of have some of your high threatening pieces in the middle because your, your opponent's less likely to have things in there to keep their caster safe because the caster if they want bubbles out need to be in the middle so uh with harbinger though the, the problem with that is that she doesn't need much in the zones to kill them. And that's that's where I think uh, Charybdis probably could have been positioned a little bit better this time around. Uh, but you really don't, like, if you put a kick monk in each one of the zones, that's really all you need to hold that zone for a long time. Exactly. And I thought this scenario at first was going to be kind of rough for Harvey, but with the terrain and, like you said, punch monks, like that punch monk in the top, both games he was never in martyrdom range. And it didn't matter. It did, yeah. He like, was hanging nothing out over there could the, hit me. Yeah, he was hanging out behind the building, and even if I did get something onto him, like there was like a fifty-fifty that he was going to be getting cover too. So uh, that 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 uh, tower in the top there really helped out this time in the scenario for you. Whereas I think in previous rounds it kind of like kind of got you in the butt a little bit. Mm -hmm. And that's why I pushed Harvey down because I feel like if you have the luxury, and I say this. <laughs> very with air quotey of something that can contest very well like a punch monk like if this game went on my plan was to push bottom super heavy like harvey's gonna be probably down there just enough and like i'm pushing his flag just because i know if i keep the all bubble moving up the board towards that infantry club at the, mo the bottom like they're gonna do nothing to me under awe ashenvale like they cannot hit a menite and, like, the Menite's just going to Thresher Grievous every turn, kill three three to four of them. I'll kill some with other stuff, and then, like, we're just going to keep going, and then you're not going to score the top zone because of the Punch Monk, and then I'll have the book on my flag, probably Martyrdom range, and then it's just, like, let's just keep doing this. Yeah. Overall, I think this was a, a fun game. I'm happy to see Protectorate moving along. Kind of sad that Scar's not going to be moving any further because I would have really liked to have gotten a chance to play that Scavarous list. We might do like a redemption round one of these days with those, though. Um, the one thing that I will say I'm quite disappointed about in this game is that Ethan did not kill me with Cataclysm. Yeah, no. Not going to be. <laughs> There's no point to be greedy when you're winning. <laughs>